Hey everybody, it's Brandon with FastDataScience.ai and welcome to another edition of This Week in AI. So today on This Week in AI, what we're going to be talking about is data science at scale. We'll also be hitting on uh, some education, new programs available. We'll talk a little bit about some really interesting trends in the data science and machine learning world. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about understanding fish. No, not the banned fish. After all, I don't think any machine learning model could really understand the full depth of fish's music. Instead, we're going to be talking about actual fish. So let's get to it. Today is, hold on, let me get that configured. There we go. Today is January 28th, 2022. And G Scrapey, our little bot who was searching my email alerts for all cool kinds of interesting headlines this week, actually teed up quite a few, teed up five headlines for me this week uh, that G Scrapey found to be pretty interesting and awesome. So the first one, as I mentioned, is talking a little bit about data and analytics at scale. So this article really dives into understanding from one company's perspective what it takes to deliver analytics and data science at scale within an enterprise context. Dive into it a little bit more. What do we learn? We learn a lot about a guy named Tarun Srinivasan, who is VP and Global Operating Leader in, in Analytics at Genpact. Uh, he is uh, providing a lot of really informa good information in this article on what GenPack's approach is to data and analytics. What I really like about this article is it provides a lot of really great and useful graphics that help us visualize and provide a great visual model for data and analytics, uh, infrastructure for businesses, things to think about makes it really straightforward and simple, starts to kind of demonstrate how any business, small, medium-sized business, could start to put some of these pieces together. And then it jumps into some really, really cool use cases. So let's take a look at some of those awesome images. So here's one of them, the analytics continuum. I love this image. It's a really great model for thinking about what it takes to piece together all of the infrastructure components that any one given business might need. Even individuals could benefit from thinking about their own data science education in this way, right? Uh, a lot of these different pieces look very similar to what you might find in a typical data science life cycle. So you have data and integration, right? Then you have some level of understanding. Then maybe even there's some automation that starts to happen uh, or some business intelligence. Again, kind of a part of that understanding what that information value is in that data. And then you start moving into analytics, right? Descriptive analytics, predictive modeling, uh, and then getting into machine learning and artificial intelligence that starts to get into art, uh, uh, essentially advisory, right? Being able to use data to advise decisions. So I love this image. Let's take a look at a couple of others. Building scalable analytics requires capability in four key pillars, according to Genpact. Uh, so you have governance model things. So what's your organizational model? How does uh, individuals and different teams work together? What's the architecture and the talent needed to then support executing that? Love this graphic. It provides a really nice sort of model for thinking about how to both manage data and analytics, but then also how to execute on data and analytics with architecture and talent. Talent is so important. It's really fundamental to not only know data analytics, data science, machine learning, technical skills, but it's also fundamental to know how that ties in to any kind of business value proposition. A couple more graphics here that I found really, really uh, insightful that get into some specific use cases. Here's a model of a contract analytics use case. Looks at the different stages, gives up uh, some really great ideas in terms of thinking about how any kind of document analytics engine might operate. And so hopefully this might inspire you to think a little bit more about specific use cases for your data and data science and machine learning uh, experimentation or even maybe real application. Here's another really interesting use case that they talk about, which is diagnostics and prognostics for airlines. Uh, so data science plays a huge role in travel and travel industry, particularly when it comes to logistics, uh, but this is also inclusive of passenger airlines. So a lot of really great graphics in this article. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I found it really, really super interesting, and I'll probably end up using some forms of these different graphics in some of my own presentations in the future because they help to really communicate kind of that underlying 
architecture of data, data science, machine learning, and what really kind of drives successful machine learning initiatives and teams. All right, let's take a look at a couple of others. So here's a really great article headline, Google AI tools bring back women in science to the fore. So what's really, really cool about this article, and I've said it in the past, is we really need to champion diversity and inclusion, particularly in STEM fields, and data science is no stranger to that, particularly data science in the United States. So what I really like about this article is it does a deep dive on a team uh, of machine learning and data scientists at Google who are leveraging their skills and a relationship that they have with the Smithsonian to be able to actually drive a better understanding of how diverse groups, particularly women in this case, have contributed to science and scientific endeavors. The article talks about some really famous women who have been underappreciated and undervalued in the history of science, like Ada Lovelace, who designed the first computer program, Rosalind Franklin, who decoded our DNA, uh, and Katherine Johnson, uh, who helped us program uh, all of the things we needed to do to be able to reach the moon. Uh, so what these researchers are doing at Google is they're using the Smithsonian, its images, its documents. They're building a large historical knowledge graph, which then allows them to essentially find women who were close to men who were given credit for finding uh, very significant things in the history of science. And what they're going to start to do is cluster those women around those ideas so that they can then start to hypothesize about what role that woman might have really played in that scientific discovery. Really cool use case. I love the message. I love learning about projects like these. Uh, and it's a lot of really interesting application of a multitude of machine learning skills that would be required to drive something like this. Graph data science, uh, computer vision, document understanding, and then linking all that together. Really, really interesting. Okay, last two headlines before I get to what caught my eye. Uh, so University of Phoenix launches a new bachelor's degree in data science. Okay, welcome to the modern world, University of Phoenix. Uh, every other public institution has been doing this for a while. So welcome to the modern age. Uh, what was also really interesting, uh, top 10 most interesting machine learning applications of 2022. Were these truly interesting though? I think we see a lot of these kinds of headlines. They certainly do get clicked on a bunch. Uh, so what was this article's opinion? Well, here they are. Oh, let's get rid of that. Hold on. Oh no. Yeah, you know, I can't put these, these things together right all the time. Okay, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. There we go. All right, we're back. Here are the top 10 machine learning, sort of interesting machine learning projects. Product recommendation. Okay, that's been a top 10 for a very long time. Facial recognition. That is really cool. And there is a lot of interesting applications, a lot of very sort of um, maybe potentially questionable applications of facial recognition uh, that are coming into uh, commercial application um, that start to make us feel a little uncomfortable. There will continue to be more of these products hitting uh, the market and there will continue to be more money driving their use in a lot of different uh, arenas in social and economic uh, sort of situations. So more to come there. Uh, it's an interesting uh, avenue of machine learning to follow. Uh, enhancing cloud services, uh, so really helping to enhance the AI that's embedded in cloud services that we can uh, that we can leverage um, just simply with API calls. Uh, and so there's a lot of enhancements coming to better understand uh, documents, to better understand images in an automated fashion. Assessing creditworthiness something that's been uh, probably a really good gold mine for predictive analytics for quite some time, uh, still remains in the top 10, according to this article, of interesting machine learning applications. Chatbots, with all the big language models that came out over the last couple of years, I agree, chatbots continue to be a super interesting uh, area of machine learning application. Self-driving cars, we're still struggling there. Yeah, it sounds cool and it continues to sound, sound cool, but we still don't have them yet, or at least not in sort of full force out driving in the world where you know a person doesn't actually need to be in the driver's seat, for example. We're not there yet. Maybe we'll get there one day, hard to say, but it's another really interesting area to follow. Handwriting recognition. One of the things that I like to really kind of tell my 
teams who are building really cool machine learning applications or um, you know students that I have is look if a human can't read it it a machine's never going to be able to read it uh, and that's true with handwriting recognition now there might be some really interesting and creative things we could do to recognize even bad handwriting if we know some things that a typical human may not consider when trying to read handwriting doctors notes are a great example of that because doctors are notorious for really bad handwriting and so we might be able to understand those doctors handwriting in some cases if we know for example that that doctor is writing something on a prescription card and that prescription card maybe is associated with a patient that we know some things about so we might be able to kind of deduce but that's a lot of machine learning that has to come together in order to be able to make those interpretations so there might be some really cool uh, uh, developments coming in that area as well Google Translate, speech recognition, very similar, and fraud detection are the last three interesting applications. All right, uh, let's jump into what caught my eye this week. What caught my eye this week? Well, let's talk about fish. Here's how scientists are using machine learning to listen to fish. Not the banned fish, but actual fish. So what's going on here in the ocean is researchers, marine biologists are collecting massive amounts of data because about what's going on in the ocean uh, audio, from an audio perspective. Well, it turns out that a lot of that noise is coming from fish. Yeah, fish make noise. Not just the band, but the actual fish make noise. So one fish in particular that sort of takes the uh, center stage in this article is the damselfish. Damselfish make a purring noise. Didn't know that until I read this article. Uh, the problem is, is marine biologists have been collecting that data for quite some time, so they have a lot of it. Uh, so what they are doing now is they're starting to use machine learning to train on that audio data to be able to label what type of fish that data may be coming from. In this case, they proved that out with the damselfish. They collected around 500 samples of damselfish calls. Uh, in that audio digital data, uh, they built their, tr their machine learning model uh, and they uh, were able to identify damsel noise, damselfish noise, 94% of the time accurately. Uh, so some of the uses are going to be to help them classify that data, but more importantly, what's really cool about this is this has a real climate change implication. We can start to understand and more fully appreciate the impacts of climate change because what we can do is identify when our machine learning models are identifying more disturbances in the typical noise that you would expect in a healthy ocean environment. And so we can start to track the real impacts, the full impacts of climate change on our oceans. Uh, and, and that has implications for all kinds of things. It may help us to predict, for example, food supply uh, whenever it comes to understanding um, how our food supply comes from the ocean, how much of it comes from the ocean. Okay, so that's all I've got for you this week on This Week in AI. I apologize for the little snafu in my slides here earlier on, but thank you for bearing with me. Uh, I hope you join me again next week where I cover some new headlines that G-Scrapey tees up for me, talk a little bit about what caught my eye next week, uh, and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. If you're not catching this on Friday, you're catching it on a different day, then I hope you have a great rest of your week, and uh, I will be talking to you soon. Look for more tutorials. Please like, share, comment, subscribe, do all the things, uh, and I hope everybody uh, has a wonderful, wonderful rest of their day. Bye.